Testing, testing, testing. Thanks for your patience. We're a little bit late. We had uh, we had to uh, do some improvements to the sound quality. It appears to be working, other than the mic not being. No? Yeah. Yes, yeah. there we go. There's good story. Better? You don't have to get every story. All right, well, now that that's working, I can properly introduce myself. My name's Alex Burden. I'm the executive director of the Truman Library Institute, the nonprofit partner of the Truman Presidential Library a few miles east of here in Independence, Missouri. And it's a wonderful institution. If you haven't been there recently, go see it. We've got a fantastic well, sure exhibit there right now on Captain Harry Truman's role in World War I, military equipment, maps, letters to yeah, Bess. The exhibit been, has been up all year. It's closing at the end of the month. These artifacts and documents are going back into the vault, and you're not going to see them again for another 100 years. So hopefully some of us might still be around by that point. But I really encourage you. It's a, a fantastic exhibit. Um, the curator of that exhibit, um, Clay Bowski, is here tonight, and he's a, an underappreciated asset in Kansas City. So, Clay, I see you over there. You're trying to shrink, but instead I'd like for you to stand up and get a round of applause. <laughs> Kansas City is blessed to have the Truman Library here. Independence is blessed to have it in its backyard. Um, it's a wonderful institution. We have wonderful staff members like Clay, a, a great curator, and Kurt Graham, who's my friend and colleague right down here in front of me. Who, um, so I, I really encourage you to take advantage of it being here. We've got exhibits that you can come see. We also have wonderful programs like tonight's, um, like the Bennett Forum that some of you might have attended last week. And we have educational programs and resources for students and teachers across the metro area that last year nearly 50,000 students and teachers participated in. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, we're very um, committed to our mission. And I think we can all agree, Republican or Democrat, left, right side of the parties, that now is a somewhat turbulent time in American politics and having someone like Harry Truman that we can point to as an admirable leader, an ethical decision maker is a, a great thing. We have inspirational lessons from his presidency and his life available to people of all ages. So get involved and you can do so by becoming a member of the Truman Library Institute, an honorary <laughs> fellow, um, join the many friends in the audience who are donors and support the important work that we do. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can learn more about our programs through an email distribution list. Visit our website, TrumanLibraryInstitute.org, to learn more about these opportunities. And upcoming events, I mentioned the, the exhibit that we have. There's also, for the first time ever, the Truman Library is organizing a holiday Christmas-themed day, and it's this coming Saturday. We've got special refreshments and seasonal drinks and appetizers, and there are two really interesting programs. One of them is at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and the other one is at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you're looking for something different and fun to do, travel east, go to the Truman Library. Um, in addition, I, I think because of the, the obvious reason that we have a tribute to President George H.W. Bush that we are doing on the 19th, maybe it's the 17th, 17th of January, we have a, a friend and a presidential scholar named Robert Green, who's been to multiple programs in Kansas City, and he's going to come and, and talk about Bush and Bush's presidency and Bush's legacy. So I encourage you to come to that. I'm not going to take up any more of your time because I know you're not here to hear Alex Burden talk about how great the Truman Library is. You're here for a wonderful program with some wonderful friends and some wonderful individuals. So I'd like to just give you a, a brief introduction of these three people who are going to give us a really personal glimpse into the presidencies, the White House, the legacies of two great American leaders, Lyndon Baines Johnson and Harry Truman. And this personal access, this special access will be given by our own Clifton Truman Daniel, who many of you love and know. I've, someone tonight, I think, introduced themselves as a Clifton groupie. So welcome to the Clifton Groupies. Um, and Lucy Baines Johnson, the younger daughter of LBJ, is also here. And then our friend and colleague, um, one of the, the best library directors who's no longer a library director. He's now my counterpart, the president and CEO of the LBJ 
Library Foundation. He's a great media personality. He's a, a great scholar. He's a great guy. They've traveled here, taken time from their busy lives to, to be with us. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming them to Kansas City in the stage, and thank you for your um, attendance. You're in the... <laughs> okay. Well, what a pleasure it is to be here. Uh, welcome to Clifton and to Lucy. Um, I, I want to start off by talking about being from a presidential family. Uh, knowing both of you as I do, I know it is, is both a, a blessing and a burden. Talk about how being the daughter of a president, being the, the grandson of a president, affects your life. So who goes first? Why, why don't you, well, ladies, ladies first. Ladies um, first. There is no doubt that it offers both of those golden opportunities, both blessing uh, and burden, but the emphasis is on the word blessing. You get a chance to be an eyewitness to history, uh, to see some of the movers and shakers of your time make a difference for your children and your grandchildren's time. You get the chance to be exposed to some of the best and the brightest in the arts, uh, as well as in the politics. Uh, it, it's it's a, an opportunity that really cannot be measured. But you also get the chance to live up to those blessings and, and the opportunity to try to reflect well on your family and the responsibility to live with whatever co consequences that you make for them, intended or unintended. I had the chance to uh, go and campaign for my parents in 26 states by myself in groups of five to 5,000 when I was 16 years old. Can you imagine entrusting a 16-year-old with your reputation on that level? Uh, uh, but my, my, my father wisely knew that it was better for me to feel like I was inside the tent, a part of the team, uh, being counted on than outside of the tent, feeling like I had uh, um, been abandoned by my family unit. And as a result of that, my father, the school teacher, always the school teacher, had me come back to him after every public occurrence I had made and be uh, accountable to telling him three people I'd met and three things that were important to those individuals. Well, that sounds like it's pretty easy, but when you're meeting a jillion folks uh, and you know that you're going to have to be not only accountable to your father, but he happens to be the President of the United States, it is, it is a pretty awesome experience. But uh, I was being interviewed constantly by the press and by the public. And as I was, if he had not asked me to be accountable on those levels, I might have spent the whole time talking about myself, which narcissistic teenagers are frequently very comfortable doing. But you, you don't grow, and you don't learn, and you don't take advantage of the opportunity in the same way. And I think the one thing, one of the many things uh, that the Truman family and the Johnson family felt was a keen sense of responsibility to community and a very strong determination to make sure that their progeny and their progeny's progeny <laughs> knew that although they might have had the privilege of being an eyewitness to history, there was nothing that they had done that had brought them to the table. It was purely an accident of birth. Clifton, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, well, and, and my, the blessings of being Harry Truman's grandson were a bit more concrete as well. Uh, years ago, we went down to Key West, Florida with my grandparents on several occasions when I was young. And I think one of the first trips that we took, you travel with grandpa, people put you in limousines, and they put you in private planes. Uh, they open doors for you. 
that you get to go backstage, you get to go in first. You get to go in first at Disney World. <laughs> and after one of these trips down, down to Key West, and this was limousines, and finally, finally a private plane making the last jump, I think, from Miami to Key West, my younger brother Will turned to my father and said, Dad, are we getting richer? <laughs> And my father said, no, it's your grandfather. But on the other side of that, uh, again, the same, my parents took the same attitude that yours did toward the humility of this. This is not something you've done on your own. I, I found out, I, my grandparents and my parents didn't even tell me grandpa had been president. I found out in school. The joke being, thank God it was first grade and not high school. <laughs> I went to school, the teacher said, wasn't your grandfather president of the United States? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I'll go home and ask. And I did, and my mother loved telling this story. She told this story until I was in my 50s, for God's sake. <laughs> I, uh, I walked into the door and I dropped my book bag by the door and I marched across the living room to my mother and I put my hands on my hips and I said, Mom, did you know? <laughs> And she said, yes, but just remember something. Any little boy's grandfather can be president of the United States. Don't let it go to your head. You hear about the, the President's Club, the fraternity among presidents, former and incumbent, uh, and, and, that's, and the, the sorority among first ladies and the burdens that they shared uh, in that role. Uh, but there's also a great kinship among presidential family members. And you can see it in the relationship between the two of you. Talk about that uh, and, and what you share in being the offspring and being the, the, the progeny's progeny of a president. Well, I uh, feel that immediately you, can, you have a sense of uh, camaraderie. Somebody actually understands your circumstances. Somebody has similar stories to tell. And every time there is a funeral, unfortunately, which is when we most often get together, uh, presidential families have a chance to tell the stories of, of how did it go in, in your time. Uh, one of the stories that uh, came to mind in coming here uh, was uh, I had always had a great uh, respect uh, for the Truman family, uh, and particularly for the fact that uh, President Truman had so uh, admired his daughter's musical talent, and a musical talent which he shared himself, and, and that he had come richly to her uh, defense when anybody might make any comment that was less than uh, totally adoring. And uh, I, I thought about the fact that uh, I, uh, too, had some musical experience, not talent, uh, and had gone uh, many occasions. I would not like to mention how many years to music class because I would not want to defame the reputations of my teachers. Uh, uh, but I had uh, the gift of being able to play by ear and was... Uh, somewhat lazy, and so if I could translate a music into the key of C, I could get away with it without ever having to learn to read the music. And you'd be surprised what I could put into the key of C. Well, um, I had remembered that uh, uh, Margaret Truman's pianos had, had led to the discovery of the fact that uh, after the War of 1812 and the Fire of 1814 that the restoration had not been actually up to snuff and uh, there was some desperately need work in the, in the White House so that uh, Truman's had actually moved out and moved into Blair House. And I went with my father on one and one only state visit and it was one of these Tuesday, it must be Tuesday, it must be Belgium sort of experiences. It must be, it's two o'clock, it must be El Salvador. And my father was giving a um, piano to a school. Uh, and so he asked for uh, anybody from the school uh, who would like to come up and play the piano, and there were no takers. 
And so he asked anybody from the Foreign Service who would like to come up and play the piano, and there were no takers. And then he got to his staff and looked at them very sternly and asked if there were somebody uh, in the staff who would like to come up and play the piano. And he was so desperately, he finally turned to the press. And he said, well, certainly one of you all knows how to play the piano. And there were no takers. And he turned, and I knew it was coming. <laughs> And he said, well, my daughter can play the piano. We'll have my daughter play the piano. And of course, I wanted the ground to just swallow me up. And my father thought that I could play the piano well enough to play in public in the same way that uh, uh, President Truman had thought his daughter could perform in, pro in public, except there was one significant difference is that she had talent. <laughs> and, and so there I was. but. Uh, uh, all I can say is the people at this El Salvadorian school had an extraordinary sense of, of gratitude uh, and appreciation and were so grateful for the gift of the piano that they all smiled and acted like I did very well. <laughs> so to talk about the camaraderie. Of, uh, that's that's been one of the, friends. ever since I, I think I started uh, working closely with the Truman Library back in 94, 95. And one of the, that's been one of the nicest things about this is knowing, well, I've actually, I've known Lucy and Linda longer than that because, because of our, uh, her parents and my grandparents' relationship. Um, but that's one of the great things. It, it transcends all of the, if there was any arguments between our ancestors, they're gone, we're their children, their grandchildren. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Mary Jean Eisenhower is a friend of mine, and we were on a uh, we were in Taiwan with David Roosevelt for a program on the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, and that was the first time I'd met David, and we the three of us started talking because our grandfathers had very complicated relationships, um, but Grandpa and then President Eisenhower didn't always see eye to eye, and and they had. Uh, and Ike was uh, President Roosevelt's commanding general. So there was some interesting, and we, we, we actually did a program several times. We began to talk about it. And at one point during the program, I told David Roosevelt, I said, you know something? Your grandfather didn't tell my grandfather a damn thing. <laughs> he didn't. They, I think they met twice. Roosevelt didn't tell my grandfather anything. So we all went to bed, and the next morning we came down for breakfast, and I saw David, and I said, David, good morning, how are you? And he said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Otherwise, Mark, we get along just fine. Mark, could I... Uh, Please do. Could I share a letter with this wonderful audience? Uh, my children uh, often say to... Uh, their friends. Be careful. If mother takes a liking to you, she may frame you and put you on the wall. Uh, but I indeed had had the great fortune of being an eyewitness to history. And, and just as I, if I came into your home, I might see your degrees or pictures of your children or your grandchildren on the wall. I I've, I've put the, the communications that I've had between people that were important to me, but they also frequently have been important on the world stage. And uh, uh, I brought a copy, a Xerox copy, of one of those letters because if ever the house were to burn down, it would be certainly one of the things I would go to first. At the end of my father's administration, my first husband was in Vietnam, and it was a difficult, difficult time in our lives. And we were getting ready to pack up the from living in the White House and go back to, to Texas. And like many of you, uh, it was Christmas card time and I went out and got a card made of my son and myself in front of the White House and sat down, as we all do at this time of year, to send the cards out and to, just as you might say to dear Aunt Muriel, I, I just want you to know I saw cousin Susie last week and she said to say hello or whatever your greatest news is. I sat down and on the back of this Christmas card, I wrote a little note to President and Mrs. Truman. And I said, uh, President Ms. Truman, after my father was catapulted in the presidency unexpectedly, much as you had been, uh, you came to my parents and said, 
you, how much you wanted to help if ever you could. The difference was that you actually came through over and over and over again in ways that nobody else could. And it meant so much to my parents. And I want to let you know as we leave the White House how grateful I am. And I went through uh, reference of several things, including the fact that uh, uh, he had gone as my father's representative to King Constantine's funeral just not long after uh, my father had come into the presidency and what a comfort that had given my, given my parents. And uh, so I wrote this little note and penned it knowing full well that President Truman didn't really have any staff. And it was up to the volunteers in the community who were handling those deluge of Christmas cards that were coming in. And quite likely, um, none of them might put it in front of them, but hoping with the picture of the White House in the background, they might read the back of it and take two and two together and, and, uh, uh, and get it in front of them. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would get a handwritten note from the former First Lady of the United States in thanks for the note that I put on the back of a Christmas card. But it reads, and I share it with you, Dear Lucy, Mr. Truman and I were very flattered that you had thought of us at Christmas time, and we were delighted to have your beautiful and especially happy to have the lovely picture of your young son, Lynn. Thank you so much for thinking of us. Bess W. Truman. There's a, there's a, a wonderful relationship between Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson. And the Johnson and Truman families uh, generally, and there, there are a lot of similarities between the two of them, which I'll go into in a second. But, but you have wonderful stories of being with the, the Johnsons, Clifton, and you, uh, Lucy, being with the Trumans. And, and Clifton, I want to start with you. You were actually in the White House or uh, having breakfast with President and Mrs. Johnson on the day of. Uh, President Johnson's inauguration, January 21st, it would have been the day after he got inaugurated, right. 1965. Talk about that memory. We had, my, uh, President Johnson had, had asked my grandparents to go, and they were 81 and 80 that year, and they declined. Sent my mother in their stead. Mom took dad and me and my younger brother, Will. We stayed in Blair House across the street. Uh, went, uh, we didn't go to the inauguration. My mother was the hostess at the inaugural ball at the Mayflower Hotel. And we went, after all of this, we went and had breakfast with the Johnsons the morning after the inauguration. And my mother, she's gone now, I can say, I think she was a little hungover. Um, <laughs> she, Not uh, a wise decision if I, you want to uh, go to heaven well, there's, and just as an, as, as this is off the record, right? This is all off the record? As a, as a side story, one, one thing your, your father did that was wonderful was that she was the hostess, but she was behind a balustrade, and the president's supposed to dance with the hostess first, and then dance with everybody else, and shake hands with all the husbands whose wives he's dancing with. And mom was behind this balustrade, and, and, and she was packed in with people all around her. President Johnson didn't have time for her. To, he couldn't get to her, so he lifted her over the, the baluster. <laughs> and the way my mother, the way my mother made this sound, and I'm, and I'm sorry, my mother made it sound as if it was something like this. <laughs> we found pictures in the bottom of one of my- grace. Oh, wait, Yeah, no grace at all. We found pictures in the bottom of a photo album. I mean, there's arms and legs all over the place. <laughs> Uh, so they, they, they had a good night that night. Of course, when it came time to put her back, he'd given her to Vice President Humphrey, who wasn't as big or strong as your father was. <laughs> and Vice President Humphrey just put a chair in front of the balustrade and held her hand while she walked <laughs> back in. But anyway, the next morning, we went and had breakfast with your parents. And my mother, in bad mood, combing our hair real hard and putting it, and my brother and I are dressed exactly alike, you know, the little, the shorts, the, I mean, no, it wasn't the shorts, it was January. We had the little pants on, twins. And she'd been, been lecturing us all morning and she was in a bad mood. And the elevator opened in the family living quarters on the second floor and there's Lady Bird Johnson in her dressing gown and her nightgown, canary yellow, both a matching outfit, 
and I had to tell this, I told this story in front of Lucy and her mother like 25 years ago. I was a nervous wreck. I drank all the water behind the podium. Um, and and I, I was stunned. I'd been spit polished with an inch of my life, and here's the first lady in her pajamas. <laughs> and I turned to my mother and I said, you know, I know Mrs. Johnson's a lot older than you are, but she has a lot more pep this morning. <laughs> And we discussed this backstage. Thank God we were in the White House. My mother couldn't hit me. <laughs> she had to behave. So all she said was, see that big chair in the corner? Go and sit down. <laughs> and it was in the West Sitting Hall. And we sat down with Mrs. Johnson. And after a few minutes, the president came out in his pajamas and his bathrobe and his slippers. And, I'm, and now it's even worse. I'm like, oh, great, both of them. And he endeared himself to us immediately. I had a paper to write. When a teacher lets you out of school, <laughs> you have to write a paper about whatever you've done when you're not in their classroom. So I had to write a paper. The president knew that, of course. And he got up, went to his desk, came back with everything he could find that had his name on it. <laughs> Stationery, envelopes, pens, pencils. And in the middle of this, he's giving us these piles. And, and Lady Bird Johnson reached across the coffee table and snatched something out of his hand and said, Lyndon, for God's sake, you can't give them those. He was trying to give us each a book of White House matches. <laughs> I, I, I thought he was great, right? Like, Damn it, I almost had matches. <laughs> and years later, I'll, I'll end with this, when, when I told this story in, to an audience at the Johnson Library in 1995, when I wrote a book about this, um, I told that story. And we had dinner with, with Lucy and her kids and Lady Bird up on the seventh floor of the library. And as dinner started, Lady Bird tapped on a, on a glass and said, I would like to make a little presentation to Clifton for coming here and speaking to us this evening. And she turned to me and said, hold out your hand. And I just thought for a split second, she's got a ruler back there under the <laughs> and, and I held out my hand, and into it she dropped two books of matches. <laughs> They were, they were LBJ ranch matches. I've still got them in my top dresser drawer. Lucy, your parents came here uh, to Missouri to Independence, the Truman Library, where your father signed Medicare and Medicaid into law. And you have a very special memory. Here's to Medicare. Uh, and you have a very special memory of that day. I'd love, Share that. I'd love to do that, but if I could digress for just a second. Uh, in listening to uh, you tonight, I wanted to continue the Johnson family tradition <laughs> and, and wanted to thank you for inviting me to come to Truman Territory and get to meet so many good people whom my father really related to because he was from uh, a small town. And he recognized, not that Kansas City is, of course, a small town, but Independence certainly was when he was growing up, uh, uh, relatively as my father was. And I thought to myself, you said pens and pencils and papers. But a few years have passed, and I thought maybe he didn't, in those few minutes, manage to grab a pair of presidential cufflinks out. So, it's, oh. so and, and, and you see, there's a dilemma. The dilemma is, this was in his estate. It is exactly as it was the day he died. So that is 50-year-old wrapping. And uh, their challenge is, do you want to you, do you want to open it and wear it, or do you, you want to leave it and put it next to? Well, I have buttons, and, so and, I think and, and, and I'm matches in the in, thank in the you, Lucy. chest drawer. Thank you very much. Oh. So, Lucy, share your memory of talking to your father about coming here to Independence, Missouri to sign Medicare and Medicaid into the law at the Truman Library? Well, whenever I was found wanting, which is unfortunately not infrequent, my father would call me by my double name. 
And I asked my father when I learned that he was going to come to Independence to sign this really landmark legislation in the law. I foolishly said, Daddy, I don't understand. Why are you going to Independence to sign this legislation in law instead of doing it in the East Room of the White House with all that great aura? And my father said, oh, Lucy Baines, and I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> He said, we are going to independence simply because it is the right thing to do. Uh, President Truman, <laughs> President Truman marched the whole concern of equitable health care into the conscience of the American people. And there may not be a soul on earth who still remembers that, but I do. And I want to make sure that I go to independence and I give President and Mrs. Truman the first Medicare cards we have, Medicare card number one and Medicare card number two, to them because they deserve it. That's why we're going to And in true Lyndon Johnson fashion, he proclaimed Harry Truman the true daddy of Medicare. Uh, I will say, as the, the former director of the, uh, the LBJ Presidential Library and the, uh, the current uh, president CEO of the LBJ Foundation, you have in independence one of the great treasures of our nation in the Truman Library. And you have at the helm, You, you have at the helms of the Truman Library Institute and the, the Truman uh, Library uh, two of the great leaders in the presidential library systems. You have uh, Alex Burden heading up the foundation and Kurt Graham heading up the, the library. You could not have two finer leaders uh, helming those institutions. How much uh, did they pay you to... Uh, <laughs> that, is a, that is a sincere appraisal of my uh, my colleagues. You're, you're very fortunate to have those well, in this community. Well, I'm kidding. Clifton, I just noticed as I looked out into this audience that you all gave a resounding applause for not only President Truman, but for Medicare. And I looked out and I noticed some of the color of your hair. <laughs> And, and, and thought about the fact that it would be the exact same color mine would be if I hadn't been to the beauty shop recently. And, and uh, so it means an awful lot to me as Lyndon Johnson's daughter that so many of you uh, appreciate Medicare and most especially know and appreciate the man who uh, walked it into our conscience and the man who was able to put it over the goal line. Daddy felt so very strongly that love wasn't love till you gave it away and that there was always more than enough credit or blame to go around. And if you gave the credit to somebody else, by gosh, you could always get so much done. And I think that uh, in many ways, Lyndon Johnson felt that a lot of what he was all about was trying to get the unfinished agenda that Harry Truman had the courage to tell the American people we need to work for, for a more equitable country on all fronts, not just with health care, but with race relations. And uh, he intended to do that. And, and I'm so glad to be back here with Clifton because I think that uh, he and I both have a real privilege to be the progeny of men who cared deeply about this country, who tried hard as they could, and who indeed um, made some mighty accomplishments that we're all the beneficiaries of. Well, I want to talk about those accomplishments, but, but I'm struck in looking at these two presidents, Harry Truman and Linda Johnson, uh, uh, around the, the, the commonalities that, that each share. Um, and I want to talk about each of them and, and how they, they shape them. First, they are both products of small town American life and are very much rooted in the land that bred them. So, uh, of course, Harry Truman from Independence uh, and Lyndon Johnson from Johnson City, Texas, which is in the heart of the hill country of Texas, which is in central 
it's the central part of the state. But, but Clifton, talk about how growing up in Independence, Missouri, shaped your grandfather. He wasn't born there. No, he, was. he did grow but up But he was there. raised there, yeah. Thank you, whoever interrupted, you're right. Uh, <laughs> no, he wasn't, he was born in Lamar, Missouri, and uh, lived in Grandview in Independence. Uh, when his family fortunes reversed, his father lost uh, money uh, in the early 1900s, 1905, 1906, and he went back to Grandview to work on the family farm uh, to help his, uh, his, it was his mother's family farm. And for nearly 12 years before World War I, he was a farmer. Um, I, I, I want to say that uh, it, it was the town, it was, it was the, the work, the farming, the community, but also his parents who shaped him. Uh, my great-grandmother, uh, Maddie Truman, sent him to, I mean, actually sent him to Washington with uh, Mark Twain on her lips. Uh, Harry, always do right. You will uh, gratify a few people and astound everybody else. <laughs> and he carried that with him. He carried that with him. He, uh, they taught him. They brought him up that way. These were the, those were the values that the small town values, the working values. These were people who worked hard and had close families, close-knit communities, watched out for each other. And that's what, that's what he took to Washington with him. Well, see, how did uh, your father growing up in, how did uh, Johnson City uh, in the Hill Country shape your dad? Well, my father used to say uh, that the Hill Country of Texas was a place where they knew when you were sick and they cared when you died. And indeed, that was just exactly the case. That's why he wanted so badly all throughout his presidency to get back to the Hill Country because the people in the Hill Country would it, tell him exactly what they thought. Uh, my cousin Oriole, for example, um, uh, was a second or third or 15th cousin who uh, was, uh, had no husband. She was widowed and, and was on the poverty line. And my father took her as he did so many loved ones in to the fold and had her living at the ranch and and uh, so he he went out and he bought her a bunch of really nice clothes and uh, uh, he uh, then invited her to come to the White House because all the time she was only wearing these uh, uh, house frocks and he just wanted to spiff her up and so she appears the first morning at, at the table in in the White House in one of her house frocks and uh, that had uh, stains all over it. And my father looked at her and said, Cousin Oriel, I don't understand. I went out and brought you half a dozen dresses, uh, brand new dresses, and I thought you might be wearing one of them uh, here to the White House. And she said, oh no, Lyndon, I'm saving it for a special occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is what the people of, of Central Texas would do. And so he knew they would always tell him the truth. And the truth will set you free. And when you're in public life, you need somebody to tell you there's spinach in your teeth. And, and lots of folks just won't do it. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, that was something that uh, uh, President Truman and, and uh, Lyndon Johnson had in common. They, they both were trying desperately to uh, do right by their neighbors as their neighbors had done right by them. And uh, it, but they could always be counted on when the chips were down and Lyndon Johnson counted on the people of the Hill Country and they came in. My father, but there are other dimensions. Uh, my father was the son of a um, public servant. He was in the Texas legislature. And his mother was uh, one of two college-educated women in all of the county. And she was a journalist. And he would always tease and say, you know, you can't live with journalists and you can't live without them. My mother was a journalist and so was my wife. And by God, my daughters have become so too on occasion. And, and, and yet his father had uh, actually, as a um, uh, member of the Texas legislature, in the early 1900s had come out against the Ku Klux Klan. Well, that's no 
you know, ticket to re-election. <laughs> and, and yet that, that uh, sense of, of values, of what's right and what's just, was something that had been a part of his uh, everyday um, mother's milk, so to speak, growing up in the hill country of Texas. You also have in Vice President Truman and Vice President Johnson, you've had them ascending to the presidency accidentally and uh, taking the place of these legendary outsize uh, predecessors. And it's, it, 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 in a way, it's the, it's the worst way to assume the presidency. Talk about that for your grandfather and the circumstances, Clifton, under which he assumed the presidency. Well, well he said at the time, uh, Grandpa is quoted famously as saying that he felt like that the sun and the moon and all the planets had fallen on him. Um, he, he also said frequently that he thought there were a million people better qualified to do the job. He was overwhelmed at first. And he was very well aware of that while the only thing he could do is what he did do was go forward. He, he used the tools he had and did the job he was, he was given. Uh, there's a line in, um, in the play, the one-man show, Give Him Hell Harry, it's great, where he's talking to Roosevelt's ghost. And he says, oh yes, Mr. President, you're a tough act to follow. More than once I've heard myself referred to as his accidency. <laughs> So he was very well aware of, of, uh, of following such an outsize, but he continued Roosevelt's programs, saw the war through to the end. Uh, he was a, you know, a solid Roosevelt supporter. But he, he never, at, the, at first, um, it was, you know, he did not feel equal to the task when it started. I mean, he kept going because he, he knew he had to. And when did it change, be, Clifton, for him? Um, was, there a, was there an inflection point? Was there a a time when he f started feeling comfortable in the role. Talk about that. I don't know when he actually started feeling comfortable. Grandpa always went at everything and did the best he could, whether he felt comfortable about it or not. There was no, there was no choice. You're given a job, you do it. You There's a sense of duty. A sense of duty, and you yeah. do the best you can. Uh, we were talking earlier today about, uh, with, uh, with Kurt about Grandpa's leadership qualities. One of the things that made him a good leader is that he picked people that he was pretty sure were better at the job than he was. He picked George Marshall, he picked Gene Atchison, he picked people really uh, who, who would give him the best advice. So he surrounded himself with people that public perception might show were better qualified to be president than he was. But he was smart enough to know that you pick good people and you listen to them and you move forward. So he did all that he could. Uh, he, <laughs> he offered President Eisenhower the job twice. Eisenhower came back from, from victorious from, from Europe, and Grandpa said, seriously, you be president, I'll run with you. Get me out of here. So. Yeah. Well, my father always said first, uh, first class people, pick first class people to work for you. Second class people, pick second class people to work for you. And certainly, Lyndon Johnson was about as prepared in terms of experience for the presidency as a person could be. He'd been a legislative aide, he had been a congressman, he had been a senator, he'd been minority leader, he'd been majority leader, he'd been vice president. So in, in terms of the resume, he, he had the preparation. But nobody expected a young man in the prime of his life with two little children to be taken from us in such a shocking and horrific way and all the rest of us had the opportunity to, to uh, bang on the table and scream and shout and cry and mourn. And Lyndon Johnson didn't have the luxury of any of that. President Kennedy was his boss and his friend, but he had to bring the country back and to healing and to, to trying to take the unbelievable advantage he knew as somebody who had grown up in public life to seize the moment that we had and try not only to bring us together, but to use it to get some of the Kennedy agenda accomplished that had been installed in the Congress.
And so he was able to take all of that catharsis that the nation wanted so desperately to work through and, and, and uh, say, we're going to champion this 1964 Civil Rights Bill and make it a law as our way to, to uh, give credit, to remember, to be grateful for the memory of President Kennedy. And, uh, uh, and so Daddy was catapulted into a job. My mother said for a job she never you know, rehearsed. Uh, Daddy had, I guess, in many ways informally had the preparation for it. Uh, but uh, it certainly was the worst of all ways to get there. And yet it was something that he and uh, President Truman shared. And so when President Truman, and he talked, which was often for advice, for counsel, for wisdom, uh, for understanding, for empathy, for ideas, he was going to somebody who had had his journey. He'd grown up in that small town he, uh, uh, on the verge of the West. He understood those people. He'd been catapulted in the presidency, uh, much as uh, President Truman had. They, they had uh, a lot in common, and there are reasons why uh, um, self-help organizations are around, because they work. But uh, the uh, presence club is a mighty small one, and he had so much in common with President Truman, that it was of invaluable solace and comfort and uh, insight for him. The, the, the other commonality, and Lucy, you, you referred to this, is civil rights. Um, President Truman desegregated the military. President Johnson signed the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, letting no crisis go to waste, exploiting the, uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy to get that legislation through. And then he went further in the cause to pass the, um, to, to help uh, champion the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, doing some other things. And both of those out of the result of... Uh, also of tragedies. Tragedies that had gone question. before. The tragedy of Bloody Sunday uh, uh, and Selma uh, with the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the tragedy of the untimely death of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, to get the Fair Housing Act. Uh, I think that he often thought uh, uh, as wrenching as those experiences were for our nation and as much as he would give all that he had not to have gone through them, that he might not have been able to accomplish this good had he not had that, uh, that cathartic country who was desperate to somehow make it all not be in vain. And, and they did so, they, they supported these things to a large extent at their political peril. But going back to their roots, these are two men who come from hometowns where uh, racial injustice and bigotry were, were part of the system. They were routine. Where did the passion in Harry Truman come for social reform, Clifton? Uh, a lot of people trace it back to, and he was, they used the language of the day. Both my grandfather and my grandmother used language that we would not use today, just casually in letters to each other, and I'm sure in conversation. Um, never face to face with anybody that that might offend, but they used it between themselves and their friends. But I think for my grandfather, it was uh, discovering, it was, it was hearing at the close of World War II that black soldiers who had risked their lives, fought for their country, were coming home and being beaten and lynched uh, in the South. And that was the impetus for, for, the, uh, for the integration of the armed services for him. He was, uh, uh, I love the story that, uh, uh, tell about Strom Thurmond in the South, Senator Thurmond. Uh, Senator Thurmond was very worried about my grandfather's uh, take on civil rights, very worried that he was gonna change things. And one of, his, uh, one of his colleagues or staff said to him, Strom, what are you worried about? Roosevelt said the same kind of things. And Thurmond turned on him and said, yeah, but Truman means it. <laughs> So he was, for him, a very, uh, it was, it, for my grandfather, it was a question of simple human dignity and fairness. Uh, he, he could overcome his upbringing and, and, the, uh, and the atmosphere because it just, it was, it was wrong to treat people that way and the right thing to do was fix it. And it bears mentioning, too, 
that there wasn't the political will in Congress to pass no. meaningful legislation, but the one thing he could do with the stroke of a pen is desegregate the military, right. and that's precisely what he did. Uh, Lucy, you mentioned that your father exploited tragedy in order to get Congress, a, a very reluctant Congress, to pass the bills that, that you talked about, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Fair Housing Act. But, but there was in him, too, this great passion for social reform. You talked about your grandfather, his father, uh, standing up to the Ku Klux Klan, but there was something deeper in your father, too. Talk about that. Where did that come from? Well, uh, I think it came from two major sources. The first, I think, uh, was no doubt his experience as a young school teacher going to South Texas to what was then called the Mexican school. Uh, my father was in college at the time himself. Uh, he needed more uh, money. He had four jobs in college, and he still didn't have enough to go through school. So he dropped out for a year to try to go and earn some, and he was able to get a job at the Mexican school in South Texas. And he thought growing up in the Hill Country, he understood what poverty was all about. Uh, but he found himself down there in South Texas in this Mexican school uh, on a whole entire different level, seeing children that came without shoes, uh, recognizing that his kids didn't have any, have any basic hygiene, like a toothbrush and toothpaste to go with it. There's a wonderful letter in the LBJ library where he's writing his mother who he thought could do anything, asking her to find 200 toothbrushes for his kids. And, and, you know, she was living just a basic, very uh, uh, frugal life, and going out and getting 200 toothbrushes was just something that uh, was certainly not on, on her radar screen. So uh, uh, I think the exposure to these young kids, uh, he said to uh, uh, a joint session of Congress, never in my wildest dreams when I was a young school teacher in Catula did I ever think that I might have the opportunity to change their opportunities and the opportunities of their children and their children's children. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I have that opportunity, and I mean to use it. And when he saw the chance that he had the, uh, the bloody pulpit of the presidency, he was going to try to see what he could do to make sure that those kids had an equal chance at uh, uh, the same quality of schools that uh, uh, his children had. And uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Higher Education Act and, the, and uh, uh, well, were both part of that, as was, of course, Medicare and Medicaid and all of those tried levelers uh, that uh, society had not offered these young children became opportunities because education had been the passport out of poverty uh, for him and poor health had plagued his family all his life. He told us in no uncertain terms he knew he was going to die before 65 and that's why he tried to put two lifetimes into, uh, uh, into one and he died when he was just 64. So he knew that quality health care early and often could maybe offset that for so many other people. Uh, and those were his passions, and that was, that was where the joy in life was. That's where the satisfaction was for Lyndon Johnson. So it wasn't all about selfish, uh, selflessness. It was, it was some uh, personal satisfaction that, uh, that maybe in some small way he could look in the mirror and say, I, made a difference to somebody who deserved it. But it takes great political courage to do something like that. It took great, great political courage for your grandfather to, to desegregate the military, given the thunderous controversy that that provoked. And it great, could, took great courage for your father to champion those civil rights acts. There was uh, a great, a wonderful story about Lyndon Johnson uh, telling his staff that he was going to pass President Kennedy's Civil Rights Act in 1964. He's advised by them to wait until 1965 when he earns, after he earns the presidency in his own right, and he looks at them and says, what the hell's the presidency for? Uh, Could I give an, a, a, a PS to that? By all means. Uh, in, on 
December the 11th, 1972, about uh, five weeks, six weeks before my father's death. He attended the first Civil Rights Symposium at the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library. And in front of a, a full audience of a thousand people, he very publicly pops a nitroglycerin speak, uh, tablet in the middle of his speech. And there's a collective <gasps> in the audience. Uh, I went to my father afterwards and uh, I said, Daddy, was that a nitroglycerin tablet that you took? And he said, yes, I've been up all night with angina and it was just killing me. And the doctor said to warn me if I went uh, he couldn't guarantee that I'd walk off the stage alive. And I said to him, Daddy, why on earth did you come then? And he looked at me again and leaned back and called me Lucy Baines. <laughs> and I knew it was coming. And he said, Lucy Baines, because if I had died, I would have gone dying for what I lived for. And what more could any man Clifton, what is your most what is your most indelible memory of your grandfather? <laughs> That's probably the last one. Um, Grandpa, and it's, it involves both my grandparents. Uh, Grandpa hated long hair on men. The 1960s nearly killed my grandfather. Um, and my mother, and I, this must have been some sort of a child thing, I mean, she let, she let us grow our hair. And uh, the year before he died, I went into the house, and protocol in the Truman home is, in your family, you go in through the kitchen, you park in the back, and you go in through the kitchen. If you're a kid, the first thing you do is check the brownie tin in the pantry to make sure that there are brownies in it. And then you were supposed to go past the study, through the dining room, into the study. Grandpa was always in the study reading, and you're supposed to say hi to Grandpa. My brother and I skipped step two. <laughs> we went straight upstairs. And my grandfather saw us go by and didn't recognize us. He called my mother into the library, and he said, Margaret, who are the two long hairs walking through the house? <laughs> and my mother said, those are your grandsons. <laughs> and he said, well, they didn't say hello. Get them back down here. And my mother came running upstairs, and she said, you get back downstairs and say hello to your grandfather now. Oh, sorry. So we went downstairs, and I have this vivid memory of Grandpa standing at the, store, at the door of his study, 87 years old, uh, on, standing with his cane, very uh, frail, thin, but nobody to mess with. <laughs> and I, I remember coming around the corner of the dining room and thinking, oh. And I walked up and I said, hi, Grandpa. And he said, what? And I said, I just came to say hello. And he said, well, do it then. <laughs> and I said, OK, hello. And he turned to my brother and Will said, hi. <laughs> and Grandpa turned on his heel and went back in the den. He was furious. And just as an aside, I thought my grandmother was different. After my grandfather died, my grandmother came to stay with us in Washington, D.C. By this time, my hair had gotten to where I could tuck it in my front pocket if I wanted to. And we were, I was having breakfast, and my grandmother was sitting next to me, and she, my mother was making bacon and eggs for one of my brothers. And my grandmother turned to me and said, my goodness, you have beautiful hair. <laughs> And my mother dropped the spatula, <laughs> turned on her and said, Mother, for God's sake, don't tell him that. He'll never get it cut. <laughs> sure enough, the next time my mother tried to send me to the barber, I said, Bess Truman says, I have beautiful hair. <laughs> and the Truman Library years ago gave me a letter from uh, uh, Mary Boston uh, to my grandmother. And they talk about Key West. They talk about other things. In the middle of this letter, out of the blue, it says, I am so sorry. I'm sorry, this is a letter from my grandmother to, to Mary. And my grandmother says in the middle of the letter, I'm so sorry that uh, one of their friends, I'm so sorry she's having all that trouble with those hippies. <laughs> uh, and something ought to be done about them. Thank God, my, you know, my, thank God my, I saw my grandchildren with long hair. I nearly expired. <laughs> thank God they had on clean clothing. 
<laughs> so it turned out that my mother, my grandmother hated the hair every bit as much as my grandfather, but she was willing to overlook that just to annoy my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, what memory of your father burns brightest for you? Gosh, the minute you ask for one, there are a thousand, and you try to pull them out. Uh, I guess uh, the memory that is especially poignant to me that I'd like to share tonight is uh, I spoke about the fact that I had, through no achievement on my own, got a chance to be an eyewitness to history. And, uh, and uh, I was on what we called in family, fondly, daddy duty. Um, in August of uh, 1965. Uh, my mother and sister were out of town and it was time to sign the 1965 Voting Rights Act into law. And naive as I was, uh, uh, and eight, only 18, uh, even I recognized the, the grandeur of this uh, landmark legislation. And I called my father for instructions about where did I meet him and how were we going to uh, fulfill these responsibilities and he told me to uh, meet him at a certain time in the diplomatic reception room. And I thought that was rather odd because the diplomatic reception room is that uh, uh, room that you first enter from the south portico after you've seen uh, heads of state arrive in the south grounds of the White House. That's how they enter the White House. And the East Room is the next floor up where most of the legislation that's landmark is signed. So why would I go downstairs to come upstairs? But stranger things have happened, and so I said, yes, sir. And I met him at the appointed time, and I asked him very foolishly uh, um, why we were meeting in the diplomatic reception room. And he said, so we can walk out the door and get into the car and go up to the Capitol. And so I asked him, I don't understand, Daddy, with all of this uh, um, landmark legislation that you've signed so often, uh, it's been in the East Room and the 64 Civil Rights Act was in the East Room. Why are we going to the Congress? Now, I was 18, and I had places to go and things to do. And going, and going to the Congress was going to take a whole lot longer than going upstairs. <laughs> and, and, but I didn't, of course, want to admit any of that. And, uh, uh, such a selfish young thought. And uh, uh, my father leaned back with that disappointment in his eyes again and said, Lucy Baines, we are going to the Congress because it is the right thing to do. Many courageous men and women will not be returning to the Congress because of the vote that they have cast that has made this bill a law. And many extraordinary men and women will be coming to the Congress who could never have come otherwise uh, because of this legislation. Uh, like John Lewis, for example. And uh, uh, so I smiled and said, yes, sir, I understand. And uh, uh, I'm grateful to be here. And so we got into the car and we went up to the Congress and uh, he went in and, and signed this legislation in the rotunda of the, uh, of the, of the Congress where the center, where the Senate and the House can come together and it was a it was a magnificent electric moment that will is seared into my consciousness you know now and forever and I thought good god how on earth did I get to be here and witness this and I was surrounded by not only members of the senate and the house but members of the of the, the great civil rights movement and I knew I had my my hand on the pulse of history and we left and we went back and we got into the car and my youthful curiosity got the better of me. And I said to my father, I don't understand, Daddy. Why, with all those great civil rights leaders there, did you give, oh, let me hesitate for a minute. I'm going to interrupt myself. <laughs> Who do you think he gave the first pen to? <laughs> 
Anybody want to guess? Martin Luther King. Who else? What else? Martin Luther Other King. Other guesses? By the way, that is the number one answer for the last 50 years, and you're wrong. <laughs> Any other guesses? And that is the number two answer people have said, and you also are wrong. And I said to him, why on God's earth, with all those great civil rights leaders there, did you give that first pin to that old, crotchety, grumpy Republican leader, Everett Dirksen? <laughs> and my father looked at me again, called me by my double name and said, because Lucy Baines, I did not have to say or do a thing to get any one of those great civil rights leaders to be there for that legislation. They were already for it. But Everett Dirksen, that was an entirely different matter. If Everett Dirksen hadn't been willing to stand up for this legislation and bring his folks with him, those great civil rights leaders and I, we'd have had a bill, but we never would have had a law. And that is when I learned then and forever that uh, my father really believed that it doesn't matter if you get the credit, if you get the job done, and you will get the job done so much more if you're willing to give the credit away. It was a life lesson that I will treasure all of my days. You are both not only members of presidential families, but you're also students of history. And Clifton, I wonder, uh, how do you think Lyndon Johnson should be remembered? I, I have, uh, I'm probably not the, uh, the best person to ask since I have a serious soft spot for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and I have, I have a... Uh, You've got the matches to prove it. Uh, I do. <laughs> and, and cufflinks. Cufflinks. Uh, <laughs> I have, what, what I have is, and it was always important to me, when you, when you grow up in a presidential family, and Lucy knows this to be true, you're, you, are off, you often find yourself at a young age rubbing elbows with world leaders and... and people that, that a lot of us put on pedestals. And for a child, you take the measure of the person, how they treat you, how they treat children. Uh, and I've always thought that was a good indicator with people. President Johnson, when, when we met him at the White House, um, didn't talk down to us, didn't treat us as little children. There wasn't a pat on the head. He got down, I mean, he was, 6'3", right? Mm -hmm. He yeah, got in down face. <laughs> and, he was, and he was sitting on the chair and he got down face to face with us and to talk to us. And the first thing he asked, before he started handing out all the papers, and, and what he wanted to know how we liked Washington. How you liking the visit, boys? We'd been to see the Beagles. We saw him and her at the White House the day before. I don't remember what the White House looked like, I just remember the Beagles. But, he, but he, he didn't talk down to us, he talked to us. I mean, I remember being absolutely thrilled, charmed that the President of the United States, an adult, would, would talk to me as an equal. Uh, he treated people, so that's, the, that's how I think that, that, for me, that's how President Johnson goes down the, the accomplishments, his style of leadership, which was, which I kind of like, uh, the, the Johnson treatment. I always like those stories when he just, you know, you, there's, there's great pictures of President Johnson with, with some poor senators cowering underneath him while they're, you know, trying, yes, whatever you want. Um, but, you know, all of that rolls together. I just think that, that for me, he goes down as someone who took the time, who paid attention, who really saw you when he was talking to you. He saw you, he tried to understand you and tried to do what he thought was, was right. Lucy, how should we see President Truman's legacy? Well, I was one among a jillion folks that read David McCullough's book. And uh, the man my father had introduced me to was all of a sudden there, vibrantly in those pages, as a man who wanted to a socially just world. 
and wanted to have a globally responsible world and wanted to bring people together to work to make those achievements not dreams but reality and who had gone a long way towards making it happen. I mean, just think about the Truman Do Doctrine and the, and the Marshall Plan and the whole concept of how on God's earth this man who gets catapulted into this office, having met the president only twice during the administration and having no idea about the atomic bomb, how on God's earth had he been such a quick study and how blessed I was. And then I saw the response of a grateful nation. All of a sudden, one popular book, one willingness to look back and reassess, and President Truman was being appreciated as he always should have been in my family's eyes, but as he has so richly deserved in the country's eyes. And I thought to myself, if it can happen to him, maybe, just maybe, it can happen to us too. History is... We tend to be very myopic when it comes to uh, our presidents uh, contemporaneously, but it bears mentioning that both of these presidents left office acutely unpopular uh, and, and, uh, and went into private life not knowing what their legacies would look like. And, and Lucy, I think you, you achieved your wish. Most historians, when they evaluate the presidents, they put them in five categories, uh, from bottom to top, failure, uh, uh, below average, average, near great, and great. And almost every historian would put Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson in either the great or near great category. I want to uh, thank Clifton Truman Daniel and uh, Lucy Johnson for a delightful evening. Lucy Baines. Lucy Baines <laughs> Johnson. Lucy Baines. And thank you all for coming out tonight. What a delightful evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>